हेलो बच्चो हाउ आर यू यू मस्ट बी थिंकिंग सर यू आर ऑडिबल बट वे आर यू बेट जस्ट गिव मी अट एक्चुअली माई स्पेस शिप इज लैंडिंग डायरेक्टली फ्रॉम दी मार्स हूम वो वे डिड आई लैंड इवन ओ I am very sorry. That was a pile of garbage in which my spaceship had a crash landing. Actually, I stay in Mars. You know, it's only that I just come to meet you people because this is the platform that I love to meet you people right in your ignite batch. And you must be thinking, sir, you are really joking. You can't stay on Mars, right? But let me tell you the secret of mine. And really, I am a Martian. I'm not an Earthling at all. So what I'm going to do is I've just wiped off myself. I'm now clean. I'm not at all filthy with the garbage dump. and uh, let me just quickly jump out from my spaceship right into the session right in front of you and you can see me hey i am here hello how are you and i hope you all must be doing amazing pretty cool and super duper cool right yeah so basically i am you know i am really truthful about this i stay in mars and i have few friends alien friends of mine so we were just little bit parting out there and you know we had i just uh, you know i just took some uh veg biryani that you call veg pulao in fact and i just uh, you know made them taste that and they were really enjoying it so and uh, giving them that i just came out quickly i remembered that i have to meet you people right here in the ignite batch right okay so uh, uh often people say that you know the fire of knowledge can ignite innumerable minds right and that that falls very true that in fact is very true and i know that you are super duper people and also i want to you know show my gratitude towards you that's just because hey you gave me my very correct answers that mean the question that i asked in the last video i found really amazing comments in the comment section where you gave your answers and i'm really thankful to you why thankful because you took the effort you took that pain to write the answer to answer the question and listen to the topics amazingly for every good thing you do you should be appreciated because that's a very cool law right and that is what i love to do with all my lovely students right okay so oh well let's 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 you know it was a very tiring journey i must say and i started feeling thirsty all over and if you are feeling thirsty then do get your water bottle alongside with you because this is going to be a little bit lengthy discussion so you may feel little bit hungry too so get some snacks grab some snacks healthy ones i mean or tea and coffee or juice or whatever you would like to have in the meanwhile let me uh, grab my water bottle and here it is i uh, actually it was left in the spaceship okay so yeah it was a very crash landing i was really scared you know because the kind of the way it landed the spaceship okay so uh, i'm just having this water bottle in my hand you must be wondering what i'm going to do with this obviously i'm going to drink water but after some time okay so basically i have two needs at present time number one i want to drink water so definitely the water that is present in this water bottle can fulfill my need of drinking water and it can quench my thirst right that i will be able to quench my thirst by drinking water so my one need is satisfied now when i'll be discussing with you i'll be talking with you we'll be sharing some nice moments in that case also i may feel thirsty later on so definitely i need to carry some water along with me for that case i need something to put this water into for that i have a water bottle so what i can see is or what i can conclude is that two needs of mine are solved in this case number one i was feeling thirsty so i can drink water from this bottle second i may feel thirsty in future time or the near time so i can carry the water in this water bottle so can we say that this water bottle along with the water inside has the potential to satisfy my need that is my two needs number one i will feel thirsty i'll drink water second i need to carry the water right so is do you feel do you really feel that this water bottle filled with water will be able to satisfy my need is it so give me answer in the comment section be responsive i know that you guys are amazing okay yeah so people are saying yes sir it can okay that's amazing and what i feel is it is not costly at all right this particular bottle is not costly so i think i can afford this water bottle and third and the most important point this is i think it is uh, beneficial for all right i mean anyone can drink water from this though i should carry a glass bottle instead because i don't uh, really prefer carrying liquids in plastics scientific reasons we all know that right it's not really great to carry liquids in plastics but still this is a nice plastic bottle i mean good quality but still what i can say is that it can really satisfy my need right and that is what i all i need so in simple terms can i call this water bottle a resource 
because yesterday when I, while I was going through your geography book, I just came across this chapter resources and development. And the first thing that I read in the chapter was anything that is available in the environment that has the potential to satisfy the human needs, provided we have the technology to access it. It is economically very feasible or affordable and it is culturally acceptable. That means it's good for the society. So what I feel is this particular water bottle has the potential to fulfill all the three things. That means I have the technology to access this. This is easily affordable and this will serve good to many people because many people can drink out of it. Right. So I can say that this is a resource. Come on. What do you think? Tell me. Just let me know your ideas in the comment section. Right. What do you think about it? Can I call this as a resource? Right. Because it has all the benefits. It, it has all the qualities that can make it a resource. It can satisfy my thirst. I can carry the water around in it and it is very economical. Apart from that, it is beneficial for all. So do you feel that this makes it a resource? Yeah. Come on. Answer in the comment section. That's amazing. I can see some people, some thumbs up for the uh, bottle. So hi bottle. You have got a cheer up from the people, you know. You must not be able to see that. I have hidden that in my spaceship. Okay. So after lots and lots of poor jokes and uh, lots and lots of poor jokes, let's let's get an insight into what are we going to discuss today. Right. So basically, we have this topic called resource and development in your geography book. The, the yellow and the orange color mix book, which you hardly open just before your exams. Right. Some people, they follow the ninja technique. They follow just right in the morning of the exam. Right. The Suppose in the morning you're having an exam and... Uh, you suddenly remember I have a geography book and then you open the geography book and you say oh wow this is the syllabus some people are even not confirmed about that yeah these these are very very common experiences of school life even we all had right so what are we going to discuss let's let's just quickly check it out number one we'll talk about the meaning and the types of resources second we'll talk about the resource planning in India third we are going to talk about the land degradation and the conservation measures and on number four we are going to talk about soil types erosion and the conservation measures right so it's going to be a long ride so get your refreshments along with you so that you do not get bored and do not feel hungry while we are discussing something okay so when i talk about a resource so how do we refine a resource anything that is available in our environment be it anything i mean we're talking about fruits suppose if there is an apple tree nearby your house you'll just go and you pluck an apple from the tree that is going to satisfy your need of hunger isn't it so that is satisfy your need of hunger it's easily available and very good for the society as well right there's no harm in planting a fruit tree near your house isn't it so that will serve as a resource and since we are getting it directly from the nature without any much modifications, so we can call it as a natural resource, right? Suppose I'm feeling very bored, you know, I'm feeling very bored and I want to see a movie, maybe a Bollywood movie. Say I recently watched Brahmastra that features Ranbir Kapoor and Alia Bhatt, right? So I recently watched Brahmastra because I was feeling very bored and I wanted some kind of entertainment. So I, I just checked into a mall, a shopping mall and basically I went into a multiplex, a movie theater and I watched the movie Brahmastra and after that you know what I felt I felt pretty entertained I'm just talking about entertainment here so basically the this need of mine that is entertainment need was served by the cinema hall of the multiplex okay and the ticket was affordable and uh, yeah it was good also there were many people watching the movie along with me so it was a nice atmosphere all over there so what you can say that my entertainment need was supplied by the cinema hall so cinema hall is a kind of resource though it is made by humans it is made by humans right so but cinema hall is also a kind of resource so basically if i sum up everything if i sum up everything so i just get one definition that is resource is anything that is available in our environment and provided that has the potential to satisfy our needs and we have the technology to access it then economically it should be affordable or feasible and culturally accept it should be acceptable so if these three things are done justified in that case we can label that particular thing as a resource right let's move further let's move further and let's write down a uh, clear and crystal clear definition for you all so that you can write it down in the examinations otherwise it will be like sir you did not tell us the definition what are we going to write in the exams very unfair sir okay so just all the pages aside let's write down what it is so resource anything available in our environment
that has the potential to satisfy human needs human needs provided it is number 1 technologically accessible technologically accessible second economically feasible economically feasible and culturally acceptable and culturally acceptable so all these factors are going to make a particular thing a good resource right okay now let's move further let's try to get more and more of it the interdependence factors now let us understand this a very with a very very common and normal example okay suppose if i plan to open a business of mine if i plan to set up a business of mine let's say i am going to open a biscuit factory it will say like kunal's biscuit factory right suppose i want to make biscuits high quality biscuits i mean some chocolate cream biscuits uh, vanilla cream biscuits i mean whatever flavors you can suggest me right so i want to make some good high quality biscuits now what i need to do for that is number 1 i need to procure some wheat i need to purchase some wheat from the fields right a fields i mean where you grow the crops so number 1 i'll need wheat i'll need sugar i'll need oil i'll need uh, something like this right so if we talk about wheat sugar and oil who are going to give me this definitely the nature they are natural products right so i i'll get this from the nature the wheat the sugar oil right all these things i am going to get from the nature then what i am going to do is step number 2 i am going to take them into my factory and with the help of humans or the laborers and machines i will be able to process them into biscuits right after i have made the biscuits okay after i have made the biscuits now i need to transport them to the market for selling right i need to transport them to the market for selling purposes then only you will be able to have these amazing and delicious and delectable biscuits right so but for you is it there is a special offer if i'm going to make one you guys i'm going to give it for free because you are my special people right so i'm not going to charge from you but for you it is absolutely free but for your friends you know for your friends i mean friends of friends they'll have to pay a discounted rate so it's a you know win win situation so suppose i plan to open a biscuit factory number 1 okay also to open a factory i'll need some kind of investment some kind of money obviously i won't have this much money right i won't have this much money to start straight away start with a factory so i can take help from banks isn't it i can take help from banks then apart from that what is happening apart from that if i talk about the quality of my biscuits that will be certified by fssai and uh, and there are multiple institutions or you can say that uh, i my company will have an isi tag and multiple government institutions that are going to make it certified that my biscuits are absolutely safe and good for consumption okay so what we see is here are the three steps number 1 first i need the raw materials most of which i will get from the nature done second i'll need the technology that i'm going to get in the factory right when i open the factory i'll use the machines i'll have the technology i'll make the biscuits apart from that i need the support of many people in order to market those biscuits or make them reach to the consumer for that i'll need number one financial help that i can take from the banks then i get needs to get my uh, biscuit certified and okay for human consumption that can be done by some government institutions right and after all this i need people to help me out to reach these biscuits in the market so that people can buy and consume them so what i can see is everything is interdependent on each other we took something from nature we used technology transformed it into a usable product and then with the help of institutions like bank market you know organizations i am able to produce that particular resource to people 
Now I'll keep my biscuit price very less. I'll just take charge rupees ten per packet. And for ten rupees, I'll give a very tasty, tasty cream biscuit, right? So many people can easily consume. That means I will be able to satisfy the need of hunger, okay, of many people who are able to consume my biscuit since it's only ten rupees. Anyone can buy; it's not costly at all, right? So and it is good for the people as well, right? So all the important requirements of being a resource are also served by my biscuit. So anything becomes a resource by the interdependent relationship between nature, technology, institution, and everything is managed by the human beings using their skills, their talent, and their potentials. So that is how the things work out. Let's move on further, beta. Let's talk about the classification of resources. So when we talk about the classification of resources, right? So basically, we are talking about two major particles. Number one, we'll talk about the natural resources. right we'll talk about the natural resources that we get from the nature and then we have the human resources that is human beings themselves they are the resources right we should always remember that human beings themselves are the resources and apart from human beings we have the human resources as well as we have resources that are made by the humans right we have human resources that is when human beings themselves they are a resource because they can use their technology because they can use their skills their mindset you know so these are the things that are that are the virtues of a human being and colliding in very simple way but uh, collaborating everything collaborating everything a human is able to produce a resource or make a resource more meaningful right so we have human resources and also we have the human made resources right that means anything that is being artificially produced by the human that falls under the category of human made resources in natural resources we have multiple types we have renewable we have non renewable right we have biotech we have abiotech so what you are going to do is we are going to discuss each one of them based upon a certain criteria right so i'll keep on asking questions in the midst of you in the midst of this <laughs> chapter right i mean the discussion that we are having i'll keep on asking questions so be attentive and pay attention to the comment section as well okay so what the moment i you know i finished teaching a particular part or explaining or discussing a particular part i will just ask you a question okay now let me choose okay it's lot of yellow yellow dirty fellow let me go with white now okay so when we talk about the basis of origin what is the basis of origin right so we have two different kind types of components that you have been learning since class 3 that is you have always learned about living things and non living things right so in the same way let's let's make it more formalized instead of living and non living things let's name that as biotic and abiotic components okay or biotic resources and abiotic resources okay so very very simple when we use the word bio bio itself means life right and when we use the word a bio here it stands for no life so basically all the living components when you talk about biotic resources we are talking about all the living components that can be used to satisfy any kind of human need will be counted under the biotic resources right and all the non living components will be counted under a biotic resources okay so all the non living components will be counted under the a biotic resources okay for example if you talk about the solar power it's a very good example of an a biotic resource solar power will serve your energy needs but it does not have any kind of life isn't it wind energy is a very good example of these kinds of resources so basically when we talk about on the basis of origin we are talking about two different types biotic and abiotic biotic here means something that is life or the living components or the living resources and abio itself stands for no life that means we are talking about the non living things the non living resources that are able to satisfy some or the other kind of needs okay Moving on further, let's talk about exhaustibility. Let's understand with a very lucrative example that is the chocolates. Chocolates are, you know, the heart throb of each and every one. Even I love to have chocolates, though darker ones. And you must also love to have chocolates, isn't it? How many of you are huge chocolate freaks? Though I'm not, I'm not a huge chocolate freak. But still, I want to know. Come on, tell me in the comment section that how many of you are huge chocolate freaks? That you are one person that who does not like to share your chocolate with anyone. Though I also do not like to do that, and most of us do not like to do that because chocolate, we suppose it to be a luxury. a luxury that is very lucrative very delicious very delectable 
isn't it? So chocolates are something that we really don't want to share. And how many of you are there present in the session you don't like to share your chocolates? Come on, tell me in the comment section. I'm just waiting for you. Okay, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, I can get the answers. Actually, I'm getting all my answers here. Wow, so <laughs> nothing has that sort. Again, this was a very poor joke. Okay, so I can see in the comment section that I can see people who are not ready to share their chocolates. Okay, and it's absolute fine, right? Okay, so what happens? Suppose you had five chocolates and you ate all of them. What now you can do? Definitely you are run out of chocolates. You can buy some more, right? That means they are very simple. They are rechargeable. That means you had five chocolates. You ate all of them. You ran out of chocolates. You will just simply go to the store, buy a few more. Isn't it? When you bought new set of chocolates, you can easily enjoy them easily. You know, you can very easily enjoy the taste of the chocolates again. That means once the stock of chocolate is exhausted, again you can replenish that stock by simply going to the store and buying few more chocolates. Isn't it? But what if, what if I say you have something that will take a lot of time to get you back? Suppose, suppose you have a you have an iPhone, the most expensive one. You know, I'm giving you the iPhone example because that's the most common, relates to everyone, okay? Suppose you have an iPhone, the most expensive one. You have uh, done your savings and purchased that iPhone. And you're walking on the street and you're listening to songs, but someone just came, you know, just passed by and snatched your iPhone and ran away. Okay, now definitely you'll go to police station, file a complaint. And after all the efforts, if you're still not able to get that iPhone, after all the efforts, if you're still not able to get that iPhone, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Very, very simple, you'll regret about it. Because iPhone is really expensive and costly. Really, really expensive and costly. And once lost, it will be very difficult for you to get it back again when a very sooner time. Isn't it? It's not like that ki once today you have lost a 1.5 lakh rupees iPhone and the next day you'll get another 1.5 lakh rupees iPhone. That's not possible, right? Maybe you'll have to wait some other time you know, to get an iPhone again. So basically what I'm saying is, ki it is something that if once lost, or exhausted will take a lot of time to get back okay so let's apply these conditions on the resources when we talk about exhaustibility exhaustible means to finish up right something that gets finished okay so when you talk about the resources when we talk about the resources we always have two kind of resources number one such resources which if they get finished they can be recharged very quickly or replenished very quickly this kind of resources are called as renewable but also we have another set of resources which if they get finished it will be very difficult for them to recharge them back or if we are able to do that that will take a huge amount of time right and such resources are called as non renewable resources let's that pin it down okay so we have two basic renewable and non renewable renewable and non-renewable right can be renewed once exhausted cannot be renewed or will take or will take a lot of time to renew if they get exhausted. A very good example here is the fossil fuels like coal, petroleum, because it took millions of years to form them, right? And once if they are exhausted, it will be very difficult to replenish them or recharge them or renew them, right? In the same way, we can take a very, very common example of water here. That water is a renewable resource. It gets recharged with the help of water cycle. That's very, very simple. That once there is downpour or there's a rainfall, right? The water again goes back to the groundwater, again evaporates from the surface of seas and oceans, forms clouds and comes back down in the form of rainfall, right? So this cycle goes on. So water can be said as a very good renewable resource. But if you talk about fossil fuels like coal and petroleum, we have limited stocks of it, right? 
So if we talk about that, we have very limited stocks of coal and petroleum. And once if they get exhausted, it will be really very, very difficult for us to recharge them back because coal and petroleum, these kinds of fossil fuel, it took millions of years to form, right? And at present, we don't have any kind of ninja technology or ninja Hattori door or a Dorimon's gadget that we can less, uh, just, you know, we can regenerate them in very quick time. So this is something that is very, very impossible. Here we will not apply the quote of Napoleon that remove the world, impossible, it's I impossible. These things, they sound good for motivation factor, but in reality, we can't, you know, produce coal and petroleum in one single day. That's how it goes. Okay. Now let's talk about on the basis of ownership. When you talk about the basis of ownership, we basically mean who owns a particular resource, right? So for example, you have your own house or your own car. Your father must be, must be having your own car. So that belongs to your papa and your family, right? That is your private resource or individual resource. But if we talk about the society's cart or if suppose if we talk about a public park in your area, right? You, wherever you are living, there must be a public park around, right? So that public park does not belong to you or your family. Instead, it belongs to the people of that particular area or a community, you can say, right? So just resources are owned by a group of people or a community. They are very different. Now, if we talk about everything that is present in a country, everything that is present in a nation will always be a part of a national resource, right? So if the government has to do something good for the nation, say suppose if a government wants to build a build an expressway and your house is coming in the midst of this expressway, then the authorities, the legal authorities that are working on that project will be empowered by the government to even demolish your house or purchase it from you and then demolish it. Right? In such case, definitely government is not going to do it without any notification. You will be notified that your house is coming in the midst of a national project maybe a highway or an expressway and for the national good we are asked to please give up your house for that we are going to pay you very simple it's not like that government is going to take it for free government is going to pay you the compensation the amount of your house and then you'll be asked to leave it very very simple okay so however you can always file a case in the court if you don't want to move there have been incidences where people turned very adamant about moving the from their houses and so there are many cases already going on with respect to such projects but still always it's wise you know so if something is has to be done for a national good even the private property can be acquired by the government okay now moving over to another kind of ownership there are many resources that are controlled by international organizations right and if suppose you have to take something out from there you'll have to take the permission of the respective international organization that is governing over that particular resource such kind of resources are put down to the category of international resources okay so let's pen these down let's spend all the types of resources here so it will be easier for you okay let's get started so we'll uh, first talk about private or individual And we'll talk about community owned. Okay. Let's pen this down. So this is owned by private individuals. Owned by a community, right? A very good example, agricultural land, agricultural land owned by a farmer, isn't it? Then private house, These are very simple examples of a private ownership or private resources or individual resources. Coming over to the community owned, a very good example here is the burial grounds. You know, every community has its own place of cremation. Cremation means the last rites of an individual after his or her death. 
the body is disposed of with due rituals with respect to the religion he or she belongs to right so very very simple in hinduism in islam in christianity the way of cremating a dead body is very very different and each one of them have their burial grounds where they bury the body or they burn the body right in hinduism generally the body is dead body is burnt on the pyre of wood right but if we talk about islam or christianity the body is generally buried into the ground that's how it is done okay so every community has its separate burial ground that's a very good example of a community owned resource moving over further let's talk about the national and the international resources see technically everything that belongs to a country if that is there in the country belongs to the nation right so let's pen pen this down so let's let's this pen this down you have national and international resources national and international resources okay so technically anything present in the nation belongs to national resource belongs to national resource then government is even empowered to acquire private property for national good right so if the government is doing something great for the nation for example for that it needs even a private property so authority is given to the government that it has the power to acquire even that however compensation will be paid in lieu of that compensation will definitely be paid to you it's not like that guess government is going to snatch your property away okay so please do not get scared of that fact so it's all done in a very legal very uh, basic form and you will be always notified if such a case is going to happen it's not that things are going to happen without any notifications you will be duly notified and also given proper time so that you can relocate to some places if in case the government is going to acquire your house okay now let's talk about international resources resources governed by international institutions resources governed by international institutions okay for example india has a right india has a right to mine manganese new, uh, nodules from the bed of indian ocean from the bed of indian ocean okay so basically when we talk about resources that are governed by international organizations if you want to take out something from that particular area you'll need to take the permission of the respective international organization for example india has the right to take out manganese from indian ocean and that is an exclusive right india has moreover when you talk about national resources in fact from the coastal boundary you know when we talk about a country's coastal boundary 12 nautical miles up to that we have our aquatic boundary also called as the territorial waters like suppose we have a land border like suppose we have a land border between india and pakistan we call that as border right in the same way an aquatic case as well we have some authority over certain distance from our coastal areas so certain distance here stands for 12 nautical miles approximately so we have the authority to govern the resources that lie in that area and that particular thing is called as territorial waters so if you are entering the territorial waters of certain country that means you will automatically be under their jurisdiction very very simple okay so territorial water is just like the aquatic boundary you can say of a country of any country right so that is how it works okay moving on further we have talked a lot right so i uh, let me ask you a question let me ask you a question here 
give me one point of difference between uh, give me one point of difference between community based and uh, international resources come on so i'll give you uh, one minute to answer i think one minute is more than enough 30 seconds to answer you just need to give me one point of difference between a community owned resource and an international resource right come on your time starts now hula la la okay your time starts now come on do it fast because we have lot to do we have lot lot to do isn't it water water everywhere not a drop to ring i don't know why the water is coming all the way in my head okay well i've given you 30 seconds only i'm waiting for 30 seconds and you have to be very honest no cheating right okay no cheating here so you have to be very very honest give me one point of difference between community owned resource and international resource it's very simple okay so while well, i was remembering the meanwhile let me remember some jethalal jokes mm, jethalal but the point is jethalal doesn't joke in english that's the biggest problem otherwise i could have joked like jethalal hey mr iyer where you been mr iyer right <laughs> Well, Tarak Mehta ka ulta chashma is a different emotion, right? But we can't express this emotion uh, in English, to be very honest. So, sometime when I'm explaining it out in some other way, I'll definitely take out this emotion as well. Okay, so again, a very, very poor joke. I ag agree that, 100% agreed. So, please forgive me for all these PJs and <laughs> keeping these all these PJs aside. Let, let's move further. Okay, now this is one part of the chapter where most people become gajini. Gajini here, I mean short-term memory loss syndrome. Like people, they get hugely stuck between stock and resource. That is, you can say the plight of your life or the misery of your geography chapter, right? That is resource and development. Most of the students are most of the time confused between this topics or what is the difference between potential developed stock reserves, right? Let me clear it out for you. It's really very easy. Believe me, you're going to love this. Okay. It's really, really, really very easy. So on the basis of status of development. So basically, how much a resource is developed based on that criteria, we divide into four categories. Number one, we call it as potential resource. That means you have the capability, but you're not performing. Second, developed resource. That means you're 100% good to go and you are being used. Third is the stock. That means something that you have kept at somewhere, but you are not using it at all. And reserve is that you are using it, but by part by part. So let's understand this in detail, right? Number one. Let's talk about the two resources that is potential and developed. Okay, now let's understand in a very simple manner. Suppose you had an exam. You might be having lots and lots of preparatory tests right now because you are acing for board exams, right? So suppose you had a pre-boards of yours and you scored say, out of 80, you scored 60 marks in a particular subject, okay? You did some silly mistakes, you were in hurry, you could not attend few questions. Because of this, you scored just 60 marks. But the teacher knows that you have the potential of scoring at least 78 or 79 out of 80 marks. That is your potential capability, but you are not doing it. And the problem is in the fact, the problem lies in the fact, why you are not doing it or why you are not able to achieve 79 or 80 marks is just because you are not trying to analyze yourself, analyze your errors. You're not trying to find out what is missing, what kind of quality of answer is missing or what quantity of answer is missing. Suppose an answer is to be answered in say 120 words and you have written just 70 words answer. You knew the content, your content was absolutely right as well, but you could have written that better and could have scored more marks. So you lost marks there. So basically what you need to work upon is the quality of the answers that you write in the examination as well as what quantity you are writing. Okay. Are you writing up to the mark? Are you writing as per the requirement of the question or you're falling short behind that? So that is something that you need to analyze. You do have the potential. You have the potential to convert those 60 marks into 80 marks. You're just lagging behind because you're not analyzing the quality and quantity of your answers. That's where the mark lies. Okay. Now, the same case happens in terms of resources. If you talk about the parts of Rajasthan and Gujarat, right? When you talk about Rajasthan and Gujarat, the moment I say Rajasthan, you people start imagining camels walking over sands of hills. Is it hills of sands? Okay, that was a tongue slip. Sorry for that. Okay, 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 okay. Let's move it. So basically what is happening when I talk about Rajasthan, some people go into imagination. Wow, I'm sitting on the camel. Camel is moving. Oh, hiya, hiya. Like this, camel is moving. Well, the camel is not interested to carry over it. That's a, that's a brutally honest fact. You are unnecessarily imagining you are sitting over the camel. Ask the camel first, are you interested, bro? Camel will say no. 
I'm not interested to carry over you over me and move ho oh, haiya ho oh, on hills of sand. He's not interested in doing that. He's more interested in eating green grass or leaves somewhere hanging in the tree, right? So well, that's camel's fat. Let's we'll come over to that later on. Now let's discuss this. So if you talk about Rajasthan, parts of Rajasthan and you know parts of Gujarat, they have enormous potential of developing into hubs of wind and solar power, right? Because they receive both the things in good amounts. But the point is we have not identified the quality and the quantity of resource available. That will the quantity be able to satisfy the needs of a major population? Is the quality of the resource available very good there? So we are not able to ponder over these two things. We are not able to analyze these two things. As a result, we are not being able to utilize that. We have the technology. It's not a problem of technology. We absolutely have it. We can utilize it. We know that, that these areas have the potential. The only problem lies in the fact that we have not done a proper survey of the area with respect to the quality and quantity of resource present there. And that is the reason that we are not able to being to utilize the areas or for their potential, right? So such kind of resources whose quality and quantity have not been surveyed, they have the potential to satisfy the needs. Because of this reason, they are not being used completely, right? So that is kind of the resource that we call as potential resource. Potential itself, it stands for capability to achieve something, right? Resources. whose quantity and quality have not been surveyed they have the potential to satisfy the needs right example parts of Rajasthan and Gujarat they have the wind and solar power potential We have the wind and solar power potential, right? But the whole fact is that their quality and quantity have not been surveyed. As a result, we are not being able to, we are not being able to take the benefit out of it, right? Quality and quantity both are okay, tested, both are surveyed, and they are being used. They are being used completely. So these kind of resources fall under the category of developed resources whose quality and quantity all have been surveyed properly and they are being absolutely used in good amount. Such kind of resources are called as developed resources, right? Moving on further, let's come to the most confusing part out of it. And that is what? That is the stock and the reserve. Stock and the reserve. Okay, now suppose let's come back to the chocolates. Let's come back to the chocolates. Okay, so basically you had two boxes of chocolates, two boxes of chocolates, and both are imported chocolates. They do not belong from India. Okay, so they are not produced in India. Both are imported chocolates and from some country. Okay, so definitely they are very rare. However, out of the two boxes, there is one box of chocolate which you are not able to understand it, how to open it, and how to eat it. Right, that's very complex. In fact, the packaging is very, very complex. And inside the packaging, the product is super complex that you're not able to get the, to this fact that how to consume it, how to use it. So what you're going to do is, we are just simply going to keep that packet away. Okay, you are going to keep that packet away. Just, you'll just keep it in your cupboard or your cabinet or a kitchen cabinet or wherever you store chocolates. Because when you will learn how to open it, you will use it. At present, you don't know or you don't have the technology to use that box of chocolate. Okay, very simple. Now, the another, another packet of chocolate that is again imported one. You that's very tasty one. You have opened it. That's very tasty. 
and since it's very tasty and it will be very difficult for you to get that packet again because if some of your relatives who staying somewhere outside india if they are coming back again after couple of time then only you will be able to get that packet so what you will do is you will eat that chocolate but part by part i mean you will save that isn't it for later purpose you won't eat all the chocolates at one go what you will do is you will eat one chocolate a day or maybe one chocolate in two days why so because you love them a lot isn't it you love them a lot they are so irresistible but if you eat all the chocolates they'll get finished up so you want to save it for the later purpose or the later use so when you will have too much of craving when the craving will become irresistible then you can have that chocolate right so at present you will just bite a small piece of it and you will try to eat just little little parts of it not the complete packet so what you will do is you will eat little and save more for the later usage in the same way we have the stock and reserves stocks are basically those resources which we know it can be used right it's very beneficial but we do not have the technology so we have this kept this aside whenever we'll have a technology we will start using stock okay but reserves we have the technology we are using it in a very wise manner why because we want to preserve it for the future generation that is why we are using it but in very less quantity so that we can use it for the future generation save it for the future generation okay so this is just like that packet of chocolates important chocolates that are very tasty but you are eating it very little quantity so that you can save it for the later usage so that is the basic difference between a stock and a reserve right let's get to it resources that can be used but not being used due to lack of technology due to lack of technology a very good example of is like water can be broken into hydrogen and oxygen hydrogen is really good combustible source right if we talk about this water can be broken into hydrogen h2 and o2 right so it's a very good resource good combustible resource but the point is we are not having that much amazing technology that we can utilize this right in the best possible form when you talk about reserve resources being used in limited amounts in limited amounts preserving for future generations example hydropower if you talk about the hydropower consumption of india that means when you make electricity out of the running water right basically water present in uh, fresh water sources like lakes and rivers so if you talk about the total hydropower contribution Uh, in india that amounts to only 21 or 22 percent so it, it's not like that ki we do not have the technology or the scale or the institution required to harness this hydropower but we are using it in very very limited amount so that we can actually save it for the further uses or the future generations so you can say that reserve is a subset of stock right set theory you must have learned it right set di when diagrams and all so when you talk about subset subset means it's a kind of part of it right so basically when you are talking about reserves we are using the resources in very limited amounts because we want to save them for the future generations okay let's move on further so basically why do we say that development of resources is really important or why do we even think about this fact there must be some reasons behind it let's try to gather it so what is happening we know that resources are very important for maintaining the quality of life and since we believe that they are the free gifts of nature we have exploited them what we have done is we have over utilized them we have exploited them because anything that comes for free you don't consider it right we don't value it so basically that's what we have done with the resources 
as a result we have used them indiscriminately and that has led to very pro major problems number one depletion of resources depletion in simple terms means the amount of resource available has decreased and why it has decreased because we want to satisfy the greed of few individuals there are few people who want to capture everything on the best of it out of it maximize it to the ma the profit to the maximum levels right and that has led to the depletion of resources apart from that few people are having the maximum control and very few are having the minimum control right we talk about accumulation of resources in few hands that has divided the society into rich and poor that means some people have access to lots and lots of resources while some have access to very minimum resources as a result there is a gap that has created in society of rich and poor so those who have utilized it in an indiscriminate manner they have earned huge profits they are rich people and those people who are not been able to use that to satisfy their needs even they have turned out to be poor right so this indiscriminate exploitation of resources has even led to global ecological crisis global warming nowadays recently if you are a little bit aware about your surroundings and if you have read in the newspapers you must have come across the news articles that state the headlines that yangtze river in china has dried up that's asia's largest river okay then we have say the we can say the rhine river in germany has dried up even uh, like uh, articles from world war 2 era have been discovered out of the river bed can you imagine can you imagine europe is suffering the worst drought us is suffering the worst drought and the credit goes to the global climatic change that people are witnessing nowadays right now the governments are more concerned now the governments are concerning about it over the years if we talk there have been multiple summits there was an international earth summit back in 1992 people they adopted to you know i'll say paperwork because that is what happens in conferences when you talk about concrete planning or planning on the ground hardly we can see anything it's very good to say you know sign multiple do documents and agreements and conferences but do you realize them in the reality that's a big question mark and i'm very sorry and you know, we are very sorry as a human race that our world leaders have failed us miserably that is how it goes right so let's talk about the repercussions that we are seeing in the modern scenarios so it's very important that an equitable distribution of resources has become the need of the hour that people should have resources in more equitable format that means everyone should have according to their need not to satisfy their greed the resource planning becomes very very important for the sustainable existence of the human life and also the other beings that walk the planet right so very important is resource planning because we see that india is a land where different kinds of resources are present in different geographical locations right we cannot say that this particular resource is present everywhere no different geography will have different kinds of resources and it's very important to have a proper planning system so that we can take out that resource and use for the common good of the society not just to benefit only few individuals and for that a proper sustainable planning is really really important So when you talk about sustainable development, how do you define it? It's a very important question. One mark question here again. Okay, it's a one marker here again that is repeated very often in the board examinations. That how do you define a sustainable development? When we talk about sustainable economic development, we are stressing on two important factors. Number one, whatever development you are doing should not damage the environment. I mean, whatever development processes you are carrying out in the present time or present scenario that should not damage the environment. And second, most important, we should not compromise with the needs of future generations. right so th if these two elements are there present in the kind of development process that you are undertaking then definitely the development is sustainable and this is the need of the hour because if you are not going to focus over this definitely we are going to pay a very hefty price for our deeds that is bound to come we don't know that third world war is going to destroy the human civilization but our deeds are definitely going to do it the kind of exploitation that we are doing indiscriminately we are doing it's actually impacting the environment there will be a threshold that will reach some day or the other and that will be the time you can say doomsday for the human civilization that is how it's going to be right moving on further let's talk about a summit as i was talking about lots and lots of conferences you know actions speak louder than the words but the problem is here words they hold a volume and actions do not that's how it is Okay so let's talk about the earth summit 1992 so in june 1992 what happened more than 100 leaders of the different countries they met in rio de janeiro in brazil and to hold the first international earth summit now the people were you know they were raising concerns about global climatic change now the the fact lies in the irony there is an this this is very ironical i must say that in 1992 the leaders signed a declaration and agreement 
that now the question arises has it been termed in realization like basically have you realized your goals that you signed in 1992 the answer is no this is a kind of you can say you know it's very simple you can say a kind of mask or a veil being put up on the different kinds of indiscriminate developments going worldwide you just go and sign a particular declaration and wow you have a fantastic party around it and that's all declaration goes in vain so are we able to realize those declarations or the pointers from it the answer is no the summit was convened for addressing urgent problems of environmental protection and socio economic development at a global level socio economic here stands for developing the human populations who are there in the grasses of poverty right basically there were many people who were under poverty if you talk about african nations even in india there are many children who are malnutrition and the number runs in millions it's not like that it's only hundreds of thousand the number learns in millions and that's a really matter of concern for us serious concern right so such kind of things were taken up onto the global platform and international platform in the earth summit that took place in 1992 right so the assembled leaders signed a declaration on global climatic change and biological diversity this is also sometimes called as the rio convention now this rio convention it uh, outlined some global forest principles and it adopted an agenda 21 agenda 21 is just like a pointer program we have you have taken up some points and based upon that your government needs to take an action or work upon it right let's get more into this agenda 21 it is a declaration that was signed by the world leaders in 1992 at uncd that is united nations conference on environment and development that's called as uncd or the earth summit 1992 or the rio convention of 1992 right now the major aim was to achieve the global sustainable development basically to combat environmental damage poverty through global cooperation with the help of multiple countries multiple leaders they aimed at protecting the environment and combating poverty and other important societal problems right so that the leaders or the countries can mutually share their needs and take up the responsibilities to help each other to be together in this fight against the climate change okay so and one major objective was that every state has to draw its own agenda 21 outline its own pointer so that they can work on it at the local level or the grassroots level right now the question arises why these kinds of decisions are need to be taken or why when there is a need for resource planning so let's understand this with the help of india's example india is a land of huge cultural diversity and variety of resources so you can find multiple resources in india but the problem lies in the fact that these are unevenly distributed throughout the country geography now you need to have a very careful device planning system that aims to take out these resources in the best possible way and use it for the common good of the entire country not just a particular section of people or particular group of people right so there are regions that are rich in certain types of resources and deficient some another for example some regions are considered to be self sufficient when it comes to availability of resources while there are some regions that do not have even the very important ones now it's a very important task for example let's take the example of some states here like if you talk about jharkhand chatisgarh and madhya pradesh they are very rich in minerals arunachal pradesh has abundance of water resource arunachal meghalaya they have huge amount of water resources rainfall is very good there but the problem is they do not have the adequate amount of storage options or filter options there is a huge amount of rain water that gets wasted how because they do not have the necessary infrastructure that can be used to channelize the rain water to store the rain water and use it for the better purposes as a result you can still find the shortage of drinking water in states like meghalaya that houses the world's wettest places mosin ramen cherapunji that just because the lack of infrastructure a proper infrastructure if that is put into place definitely the resources can be utilized in a more judicious manner right rajasthan has a great potential of solar and wind power development but it does not have the water resources like ladakh if you talk about it's isolated from the rest of the country now already efforts have been made to connect ladakh to the rest of the country but despite that it is called as a cold desert the temperatures are freezing the vegetation is difficult to grow people face an acute shortage of food resources right so there is again a very very big problem and deficient in water and infrastructure and vital minerals so the need is that we need to have a proper resource planning so when we talk about resource planning this is a three mark question what are the components of resource planning in india okay it's a three mark question beta please note this down please keep this thing in mind that 
what are the components of resource planning in india number one is identification and inventory of resources right first of all you need to identify that at which particular point of time or which particular space a certain resource is available you need to do a survey of its quantity and quality that if the resource available can satisfy a huge amount of need and if it can is the quality admissible that is the quality good to call it as a resource this is the first and foremost requisite right then we measure the quantity and quality of the resource we map the area we need a proper plug a structure for it then once you have done the mapping and surveying part you definitely will look on for the technology i mean the technology that you require to take out the resource from there that is really important one right so evolving a planning structure that has proper technical setup now apart from technology and skill you will also need the help of certain government institutions or certain institutions will still help you to complete that project so that is again very important so once i have mapped the particular resource a region i have found out about the quality and quantity the next important point is i will look for the technology and the necessary help required right once i'm done with this then again what i'm going to do is i am to going to match up my resource development plan along with the national development i'll see that whatever i'm going to do whatever mineral i'm going to extract it is going to help out the nation in any way if yes then definitely i'm going ahead with my project of taking out this particular resource so that is how the resource planning is done in india so these are the three components of resource planning please mark it down note it down this is from your ncrt but this question is very much repeated very very much repeated so when you talk about resource planning is a complex process how is it done in india so you can write down these three components of resource planning the question can also be asked in this way so you have to be smarter than the examiner right okay so let's talk about the regional variation uh, if the question is why is resource planning in, in india needed okay then you will talk about the regional variations because availability of a resource is a very important condition for the development of that resource isn't it suppose if a particular region is very rich in that particular in certain kind of resource then it will have ample amount of opportunities to develop its economy it's very simple right but only the availability of resource in the absence of technology and institutions cannot help it out let's take the example of african countries africa is a very rich continent when it comes to resources right africa has huge amounts of diamonds and golds everything is present precious metals are there but still african countries most of them are not up to the mark in terms of economy so what is lacking there lacking is the institution and the technology they have the resource availability but they do not have the proper technology or the proper institutions or even a very good governance that can help the country to develop as a results what happens the foreign countries the abroad countries they come into the africa their companies come into africa extract the minerals sell it at the higher prices right that's it what that is what is done so at at most apart from availability of resource we also need a proper technology to harness that resource and proper institution so that that can be channelized in the well important way right there are many regions in the country that are rich in resources but they are included in economically backward regions the biggest reason is they lack the kind of technology or the institution to make the state a very good economy on the contrary there might be some very uh, poor resource rich regions but they may be economically very developed for example if you talk about uh, any big metropolitan city metropolitans are generally developed right metro cities are developed they may lack in certain resources but they have better quality of technology and institutions so it's very important apart from the availability of resources the technology that is available or the institutions that are available are equally important for making that resource a usable one a good one right without that you won't be able to utilize that particular resource okay now if we talk about excess greed of the people has always led to resource depletion so when we ponder upon this question when we think over this question that what has led to the resource depletion then there are certain factors that come out to the surface let's explore them one by one right let's talk about the history of colonization obviously britishers or if you talk about any european country why were they drawn towards india it's very simple they saw that first of all you know who came vasco de gama accidentally landed on the coast of calicut right and he was welcomed by the hindu ruler of that particular area called as zamorin so when Zam he stayed in that rule he you know took out the trade practices and everything and when he returned back to portugal right when he returned back to his place he earned 60 times more the price of what he invested in his uh, like voyage right 
so whatever his investment was uh, whatever he invested in his trip to india he earned over 60 times of that can you imagine and from there the europeans came to know that there is a place in asia called as southern asia to be precise there is a place in southern part of asia called as uh, bharatvarsh hindustan and that is immensely rich place that has very good natural resources let's go and plunder that place and that's what attracted in the europeans towards indian subcontinent right and that proved out to be very disastrous for india because later on we were being ruled by british for over you know a huge period of time okay so when you talk about colonization the britishers they were very smart guys what they did was they were preserving their natural wealth in their countries and they were exploiting india's natural wealth what they did was they cut down the trees and forests indiscriminately because what they felt was the forests in india are unproductive and hence they need to be converted into agricultural lands as a result massive scale deforestation was carried out just to satisfy the lust and the need of the britishers right so history of colonization reveals that rich resources in colonies were the major attractions it was primarily the higher level of technological development of the colonizing countries that helped them to exploit these regions very simple where the british outsmarted the indian rulers was the role of technology if you compare the technology that the, that the britishers or the europeans possess there was far more superior than what we had at that time and that was a very turning point but say in the history that because of the kind of technology these guys were possessing they were able to master the subcontinent or the rulers whom they attacked so that is one in the most important point and owing to that technology they were also able to harness the resources of india in the most indiscriminate way and that's the worst part about it right apart from that resources can contribute to development only when they have a in a particular technology right and if we see the historical past the colonial past will come to realize that since britishers had better technology they were able to exploit our resources in the best possible way right so in india development in general and resource development in particular it does not only mean the availability of resource but it also means a good technology availability of good quality human uh, labor and also the historical experiences that we had in the past so these all things they make up the resource development in our beautiful beautiful country that's india right okay wo oh. So lots and lots of discussion, right? So it's it's just like I, I just felt like I've I'm discussing with my friends out there. You know, we are having a very healthy discussion out here. Okay, so consider this as a discussion only because ah yeah, and you can grab your cup of coffee, mug of coffee, or tea, cup of tea, whatever you would like to have. You know, that will keep you energizing. For me, you are the energy always. For me, you are guys are the energy always, right? and your energy is my energy so if someone asks what is the secret of your energy so my energy is you right so as long as you guys are here keeping me supporting here right there in the discussion that we are having definitely i am going to be energized super energized right okay so tell me one thing how many of you love to have uh, you know lot of junk foods junk hair okay you know when i call pizza a junk food it really pains hair I know pizza is very tasty, especially that thin crust cheese burst pizza. Though I'm not a huge Domino's fan, I'm not a huge Pizza Hut fan because they serve really thick wala crust, you know. So that that's not you know that's really not very interesting. But yeah, thin crust pizzas you must try out that. So any any anyone who's a pizza fan out in the house, I especially love pizzas a lot. I know they are very unhealthy, so but I try to avoid them. But still, I have uh, one pizza in four or five months. That's how it is. So, but they are really tasty ones, right? They are really tasty ones, isn't it? Okay. So, how many pizza lovers in the house? Just give me a thumbs up in the in the comment section. In the comment section, just give me a thumbs up. Okay. So, we are not conserving pizza here. Do not consider it. Then now, someone is going to ask me, sir, it's pizza resource. Ah, uh, yeah, definitely, it's pizza is a resource. I will say it's a luxury, moreover, because it's costly as well. It's not that exp affordable, economically affordable. If I you buy a medium pizza, it will cost you four hundred rupees. Not a cup of tea. Yeah, everyone cannot spend four hundred rupees for just a piece of bread, right? That's how it is. So pizza is moreover a luxury. Okay, after many many uh, pizza lovers, I can see in the house. Let's move on further. I just gave you a pizza break because I literally cannot provide you with a pizza right now. Had I these powers. i would have really you know poured in some pizza on the plates on the all the students who are studying right here you know but it's virtually not very possible for me however i did not try to show the picture of pizza even otherwise you guys will feel you know very very hungry in that case and you'll just run away to order a pizza and i can't afford it that right okay so 
lots of poor jokes lots of pizza jokes let's move further i know the journey is going to be pretty long but let's move further let's talk about resource conservation conserve means to protect something okay we all know that that resources are very vital for any kind of development but this irrational type of consumption that means over utilization of resources has led to lots and lots of problems and to overcome these problems we need to conserve the resources or protect the resources right so gandhi ji said that there is enough for everyone's need but not for anybody's greed now gandhi ji was gandhi ji had amazing thoughts he said that if your need has to be satisfied we have good amount of resources but if your greed has to be satisfied then we don't have resources i'm very sorry my child it's not for your greed it's for everyone's need what gandhi ji want to stress was he placed the greedy and selfish people and the exploitative nature of modern technology the major cause for resource depletion at the global level he said that because few people are powerful they have the money they have the technology that is why they are able to exploit the resources and that is the main cause of misery that is the main cause of resource depletion he said that instead of mass production mass production here means you have got a machine and that machine is producing something in huge quantities so instead of that mass production he said that it should be done by more and more people instead of bringing a machine and producing things in larger quantities it's better employ more people give them more employment and con uh, like make the products out of them right very simple that means make the products out of their skills and uh, use their technical skill instead of using a simple technical technology instead of some using a simple machine that is what he advocated for that instead of mass production go for the production by the masses right gandhi's thoughts were great to be very honest we talk about what international actions were taken with respect to this in fact gandhi ji's ideas were respected by a lot of people we talk about that at an international level the club of rome for the first time advocated a sustainable system sustainable system means development in the most sustainable manner that is without damaging environment keeping everything in mind so in 1974 gandhian philosophy was presented by schumacher in the book small is beautiful small is beautiful that's a book written by schumacher that's an author right so he presented gandhi's beautiful philosophy that of like uh, objecting the mass consumption or the mass production and replacing it with production by the masses and like uh, put putting forward the philosophy of the greed one and the need one that we just uh, you know passed by we just studied about that so basically schumacher in his book small is beautiful this question comes from one mark that who is the author of the book small is beautiful the answer is ef schumacher so basically schumacher in his book very well presented what gandhi ji's thoughts were what gandhi's philosophy was okay chaliye there is one more report called as bruntland report bruntland commission report so this introduced the concept of sustainable development and it advocated it as a means for resource conservation this bruntland report was published in a book entitled our common future so this was the commission that was formed it submitted its report and it advocated that sustainable development is the need of the hour if you want to preserve the resource if you want to make it a good place then sustainable development is the only key to do it right and this this report was also published in a book that titled our common future okay wow so finally we have reached almost <laughs> midway through our journey and we have come over to the land resources we'll talk about the different kinds of land resources we'll have some key analysis from the pie charts and then we'll move to the soil profile and the land conservation and that's all for the day right it's very very simple so hardly more 15 15 more minutes i'm going to take off yours after that you will be very free to eat your pizzas and burgers so if we talk about the land so land basically falls under different relief features relief here stands for mountains plains plateaus etc right so if we talk about the geographical features if we talk about what percentage of geographical feature is acquired in india's geography then we'll analyze that 43% of india's area is made up of the plain areas we have 30% of the mountainous areas and 27% accounts for the plateau region so this is a major relief division when we talk about india geographical pattern 43% captured by plains 30% by mountains and 27% by plateaus so if we talk about the land utilization land can serve many purposes right land is a very important resource and it can be utilized in multiple ways number one we have land in the form of forest that you call jungle in hindi right so there are many forests however the desired forest the desired percentage of forest is still far away we according to the national forest policy 1952 the desirable percentage of forest cover in india should be 33% but we are far behind that right 
नेक्स्ट वी हैव लैंड दैट इज नॉट अवेलेबल फॉर कल्टीवेशन दैट ऑन विच यू कैन नॉट डू फार्मिंग एंड दैट लैंड इज इधर द बैरन और द वेस्ट लैंड बैरन लैंड इज एक्सट्रीमली अनप्रोडक्टिव वन वेरी इट्स वेरी डिफिकल्ट टू कैरी आउट एग्रीकल्चर ओके एंड सेकेंड इज द लैंड इज दैट इज यूज फॉर नॉन एग्रीकल्चर यूजेस फॉर एग्जाम्पल बिल्डिंग रोड फैक्ट्रीज शॉपिंग मॉल्स ऑल दीज काइंड ऑफ लैंड कैन नॉट बी यूज फॉर एग्रीकल्चर पर्पज सो दिस इज लैंड पुट टू नॉन एग्रीकल्चर यूजेस then we have other uncultivated lands okay other uncultivated means on which farming has not been done and that includes permanent pastures and grazing land i mean on which cows and buffaloes and goats they have their feast nice feast that, that's a buffet for them they go there and graze mm, mm, they enjoy that grass right so that kind of lands on which permanent pasture and grazing is done we have land under miscellaneous tree crops that means multiple types of you know trees you may find there so that is again there and we have cultivable waste land that means any kind of land that is being left uncultivated for more than 5 agricultural years okay that is cultivable waste land that means any kind of land any piece of land on which farming has not been done for more than 5 years that falls under this particular category right then we have the fallow lands this is again a very important question can be asked in 3 marks or this entire land utilization topic can be asked in 5 marks that's why i made five pointers here Okay, so when we talk about fallow lands, we have two types of fallow lands: current fallow and other kind current fallow. When we talk about fallow, current fallow, that means the farming has not been done for one year or less than one year. We have a certain piece of land on which we have not done any kind of farming for one year or less than one year. That is falling under current fallow. When we talk about other than current fallow, that means we have a piece of land on which farming has not been done for between one to five years. That means it may be possible that farming has not been done for the past two years or three years, four years or five years, right? Right. So between one to five years, if the farming is not been done on a certain land, that falls under the category of other than current fallow. It's that easy to understand. Okay. Now there's an interesting change in NCERT we see nowadays. Earlier the question was there for what is net zone area, but net zone area itself was not given in the book. Okay. However, they have included in the recent updated NCERT is the definition for net zone area. So net zone area is the physical extent of land on which crops are grown. This is crops, please, not the crops. Okay. So this is crops. So please make a correction here. The physical extent of land on which crops are sown and harvested is called net zone area. For example, if I have this much big area, land area, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the total amount of area that is present in this land, and that counts for the net zone area. So, for example, I have this land area. I have grown crops everywhere. I have grown crops everywhere. Now I'm going to crop every. I'm, I have grown crops everywhere on entire piece of land, and I've harvested these crops. So this entire extent of land is going to give me my net sown area, right? The total area on which the crops are sown and harvested that is basically your net sown area, right? And when we add to net sown area a piece of land on which agriculture is done more than one year, once in a year, suppose I have a piece of land on this I do agriculture more than once a time a year, okay? More than one time a year, this land. Plus the net zone area will give me the gross cropped area. Okay, suppose net zone area is the very physical amount of land on which I am sowing a particular crop and harvesting it. The total land area comes under net zone area. But when I am talking about gross cropped area, what I am going to do is suppose I have one more piece of land on which I do farming more than once in a year. So what I am going to do is I am going to that area. I am going to add with net zone area, and that will give me my gross cropped area. right so both the definitions are very very important they can be individually asked for one markers or together this topic can come for five markers okay very simple okay so how do we define the land use pattern in india we have two different factors when we talk about land use pattern we have physical factors and we have the human factors we have physical factors and we have the human factors when we talk about physical factors we have topography of a place what kind of relief is there we have the topography we have the climate of a place we have the soil of a place soil type of a place okay when we talk about the human factors we consider population of a certain area what kind of population it has population density how many people are living in a certain area okay and we have the technology what kind of technology is present in that particular area right and we also have the culture and traditions that exist in that particular area okay culture and traditions that exist in that particular 
area. So all these are taken into account and then we come to know that how a land is utilized in a particular region of India, right? For example, some lands might be tribal lands where that are being governed by some tribal groups. So you won't find very extensive cultivation over there because neither they have the technology. Apart from that, they are very much attached to that land owing to the cultures and traditions. So you won't find a very high scale level of agriculture development in those areas, right? Also, if we talk about the mountains and the hilly areas, the topography or the relief of the place does not allow the farmers to use extensive agricultural practices. As a result, agriculture in mountainous areas is very, very limited. Right. So these all factors are very, 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 very important when we talk about how the land is utilized in India. Right. Now, let's come to the most awaited, most awaited flow charts of the pie charts. I must, must, I must correct myself. These are the pie charts, right? The pie diagrams, you must have learned them already in mathematics. Yeah, mathematics is a subject that haunts a lot of people. Right. Again, a poor joke. Sorry for that. Okay, so let's talk about the kind of changes that we admire or that we see in the land use pattern in India. Okay, we'll just try to grab a hold of it. If you see, if you consider the 1960 and 61 data and if you have a look at 2014 and 41, 5, 15 data, you'll find that uh, the net zone area has reduced. The net zone area has reduced. If you talk about 61 data, net zone area, NSA was 46.26%. Whereas if you talk about 14-15 data, it's only 45.5%. That means the net zone area has reduced. Okay. If you talk about the forest area, that has certainly increased from 18.11 to 23.3. That's a good and positive sign. But still we are falling uh, behind the 33% desired mark. Right. Then if you again, if you talk about the other kind of areas, for example, the dark red mark, the barren and uncultivable wasteland that accounts for 18.11% in 61. However, that has been reduced to 5.5% in 2014 and 15. So that's a really remarkable achievement. So that has come down from 18.11 to 5.5%. If you talk about the area under non-agriculture use, this was just 4.95% in 1661. And that has increased to 8.7%. That means we have more and more constructions, railways, roadways, buildings, factories opening up. As a result, land put to non-agricultural use has increased over the period of time. Okay. If we talk about permanent pastures and grazing land, that was 4.71% earlier. However, that has reduced to 3.3%. That means the land under the permanent pastures has reduced if we compare the data of 61 and 2014-15. Okay, moving on further, if I talk about area under miscellaneous, yeah, I mean mixed crops and trees, that was earlier 1.50%. Now let's see, has it increased? So this has decreased. This is only 1% now, right? So we are done with this. Okay, if you talk about the cultivable wasteland, that was earlier 6.23%, has now been reduced to only 4%. So that's a nice achievement. Right, the culturable wasteland that was earlier 6.23% has now been reduced to thus 4%. If we talk about the fallow land other than the current fallow, I mean we are talking about this graph probably. So if we are talking about the fallow land other than the current fallow, then it was 3.50% in 1661. However, it has little bit increased to 3.6%, right? And if we talk about the current fallow land, it was 3.73% back in 60-61 and it has increased here in 2014-15 that is 4.9 percent so this is something that is a mix of positive benefits and the negative factors right so at times we can see that the nets uh, so there are some positives like you can say that land under non-agriculture has improved or increased that will say that secondary and tertiary sectors are growing okay however we also see a reduced reduction in the net zone area and other important factors Okay, so if you analyze this flow chart, you will come to see that some areas we have done well, while some areas we are lagging behind. And owing to this, we have done a key analysis of it. Okay, we have done a key analysis of this entire pie chart. So I think we have already discussed the different kinds of changes we have seen in 1661 and 2014-15. Now let's have a quick key analysis of the same. If you talk about the total geographical area of India, that is 3.28 million square kilometers. However, this accounts for only 93% of country's area. The biggest reason being we have not explored the northeastern regions. Also, the some regions that have been occupied uh, by Pakistan and China in the parts of Kashmir in India that we call as China occupied Kashmir and Pakistan occupied Kashmir. So that are also not included in India's geographical area. 
right so that is again we can say we have just 93 94 percent of the total reporting of the total land area that we know today land under permanent pasture has decreased we saw it in the pie chart then most of the other than current fallow land is of poor quality or if you are cultivating this land and the cost of cultivation is very high so again this is of no usage hence these lands are cultivated once or twice in about two to three years and if we include this in the net zone area, then definitely the net zone area will increase to 54%. But we do not include such kind of lands, okay, that are cultivated once or twice in, in about two to three years. We are not including these kinds of lands. That's why the net zone area is coming comparatively down. If you include this, it will amount to 54%. The pattern of net zone areas will definitely vary great from place to place, especially the areas that lies in the northern plains will have adequate amount of soil facilities irrigation facilities as well as good amount of land areas so here the net zone area will obviously be very higher if you talk about Punjab and Haryana that it accounts for 80 percent of the total area while if you talk about the northeastern states like Arunachal Manipur Mizoram out of their total geographical area the net zone area is only 10 percent because of the geographical barriers now what else have we analyzed we have also analyzed that forest area in the country is very low the desired percentage is 33 percent as per the national forest policy but we are lagging behind okay and uh, it's very very important if we want to maintain the ecological balance again if we see that the term that is uh, a land that is termed as wasteland and land put to non-agricultural uses so we see that in the pie chart we saw that land that is put to non-agricultural uses has comparatively increased wasteland includes rocky lands desert areas that are of no good usage okay and also the lands that have been put to make up different settlements like roadways railways school buildings shopping malls right so that is also not considered in the net zone area definitely because we are not showing anything on it right so what we have done is continuous use of land and that to without proper measures without proper conservation measures has actually led to the depletion of lands over a period of time right so basically we have what we have done is we have indiscriminately used the land without giving a second thought and that has resulted into the degradation of land right let's let's ponder over let's think upon some factors of degradation like what is the major reason behind the degradation of land area right mining sites once the work is complete they are abandoned they are open pits they are even a threat to the wildlife suppose if a mining is being done nearby in the proximity of a national park or wildlife sanctuary it is a very much probability that an animal may fall into that open dig pit and that that pits are really deep and that can lead to the cause of uh, you know in fact that can lead to the loss of life of an innocent animal but who cares if you talk about states like Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, MP and Odisha, deforestation due to mining is the major cause, right? If you talk about the states like, which are the states, beta? Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, MP and Odisha, the major cause of land degradation is mining. These states are very rich in minerals. As a result, mining activity is done very extensively in these states, but no proper measures are taken to combat the environmental damage that is being done because of this mining activities. As a result, land has degraded severely. Moving over to states like Gujarat, Rajasthan, MP and Maharashtra, overgrazing is again a major problem. We are basically the people have let their cattle, you know, cows, buffaloes, goats to just go out in the open ground. And the problem lies in the fact when the overgrazing comes into play. That means if you are feeding your cattle on the same ground again and again and again, it will never give a chance to the grass or the natural vegetation to grow back or restore back. As a result, the land gets degraded and that is the major cause in Gujarat, Rajasthan, MP, Maharashtra. The land degradation due to overgrazing. If you talk about agriculture states like Punjab, Haryana, Western UP, over irrigation is the major problem. What happens in these areas, there is extensive agriculture. As a result, you'll find that lot of irrigation is done, which at times proves to be harmful because water gets locked in the fields. As a result, when the water stands in the fields for longer period of times, it degrades the soil quality and ultimately the soil gets degraded, the land gets degraded. These are the major factors of land degradation that are causing in India right in fact if we talk about the mineral processing industries like those who grind limestone for the purpose of cement industry they also beta make it very difficult for the surrounding water bodies because there's a layer of that uh, particular material that gets deposited on the water or on the ground and it makes it very difficult for the normal rain water to seep underground right as a result the ground water is not able to get recharged leading to different kinds of shortages in the area also the kind of industrial effluents that the industries release in the water before even treating them that harmfully impacts the overall water pollution levels right 
so what happens the industries they uh, without treating their harmful chemicals they release it in the seas and oceans and water bodies and as a result what happens the water gets polluted then the same water somewhere or the other transfers or when it is used by a farmer for irrigation purpose then again the land also gets degraded because of harmful chemicals so it's a kind of interdependence you can say on the different pollution factors right so these are some of the things that need to be combated that needs to be carried out something needs to be done to save the land from degradation because it's a very important resource if no quality land is left how will you grow crops how will you live on it it's really difficult right okay so there are many many ways to conserve it afforestation proper management of grazing areas is number one second we can plant shelter belts okay to control this grazing areas especially in desert areas you can plant shelter beds to stabilize the sand dunes that move from here to there with the help of the wind movement okay then we can do proper management of the wastelands in fact we can control some mining activities we can formulate some rules and regulations that if mining activity has to be done they have to follow certain environmental norms so that the damage can be minimized it may not be able to prevent prevent it but we can definitely minimize the damage also we should make it mandatory for the different industries to treat their chemical effluents to treat the discharge water that they're discharging from their you know so called factories they should be treated before getting released into the water bodies however we do have reforms and regulations for it but they are hardly being practiced the whole thought lies in the fact that the government needs to take up these issues more seriously and implement it more seriously and the people who are accountable for checking it out should be dealt very strictly that's how it has to be done right then only we will be able to conserve land and the water resources right there are times when someone asks what is a shelter belt sir shelter belt is nothing but we plant uh, the plants of different heights this helps to bring the uh, this helps to break the wind movement right suppose you can see in the picture in the diagram that we have planted different height plants so what is happening instead of the wind going straight away and causing damage to the vegetation the wind flow is getting broken as a result it is not being able to damage the major crops or the real crops so this kind of settlement is called as a shelter belt okay wo so finally <laughs> we have come to the last part of our discussion that is soil a resource so and you have been an amazing audience all throughout listening to me very very carefully very amazingly and i'm really grateful to you out for that isn't it so you have been really amazing audience because of you i feel so empowered so amazing you know so ignited that's what the benefit that's what the best about the whole ignite ign ignition batch for ignite batch right okay okay and and one more thing one more thing if you are worrying that sir where will i get all these pointers and notes very simple just download the physics wala app or you can log on to pw.life just register there you have the option to go into ignite batch the moment you type ignite you will get to see that ignite batch and just you have to enroll in that once you are enrolled you can see the class under the social science subject right you can easily be able to see this class and download the notes in the pdf format okay and also i am giving you some set of questions you can also download that they are the daily practice set of questions so everything you are going to get it on the physics wala application absolutely for free you don't have to pay even a single amount for that okay so do not worry you have to pay zero rupees for that it's absolutely free and just have to download the application register yourself in the ignite batch and that's all for you right very simple so i i'm just reiterating it if in case you have missed it out if you have a confusion that from where we'll download the notes okay so let's talk about soil but the soil is something that supports a huge amount of population right there are multiple microorganisms who love to live in the soil soil is that one place that helps plant support plant vegetation growth isn't it and the different types of living organisms especially the microorganisms right it takes millions of years to form even few centimeters of soil right different forces of nature like temperature running water wind the glaciers right the decomposers they all work together to break a huge rock into smaller particles that we understand as soil you know what happens a huge rock is there under the different atmospheric circumstances under the different physical forces natural forces that big big rock it breaks down into small smaller pieces finer particles that ultimately makes up your soil and there's a when 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 more very special thing about soil see just like as you carry the characteristics of your parents right your parents peculiar characteristics you carry them in the form of genes or genetic material in the same way the rocks 
the soil the out of the rocks that have been broken down to form a particular soil so the soil that is formed will always carry the characteristics of its parent rock and that's a speciality about it right the climate vegetation and other forms of life and time are important factors in formation of soil chemical and organic changes that take place in the soil they play a very very important role in sustaining the different kind of vegetation over it or around it right okay so soil contains of both the things that is organic matter what happens when the different plants and animals they die they mix it up with the soil and this enriches the soil quantity or you can say this enriches the soil fertility so this dead dark organic matter is called as humus and a soil that is very rich in humus will always be a very fertile soil as well as it also has some inorganic materials right the different minerals so when we talk about a soil profile this is how it looks if we talk a inch of soil or some few centimeters of soil and if you try to analyze it then it will have an unweathered parent rock that means that has not been broken down that is still little bit solid then we have substrata that is the weathered parent rock that means a rock particle that has already been broken down into finer particles then we have the subsoil and then we have the topsoil topsoil is the place where you can see the plants and the different kinds of vegetation growing so when we talk about soil erosion we basically refer to the carrying away of this particular area of soil and this is the most fertile soil that supports the most kind of vegetation right so this is the entire soil profile so on the basis of the factors that are responsible for soil formation color thickness age chemical and physical properties the soils are divided into multiple categories so we will try to just know about each and every category in detail okay now let's talk about the alluvial soil alluvial soil is you can say is the most widespread soil in the northern part of the country it is a very very fertile soil very good for agricultural purposes now when we talk about the northern plains the northern plains has been formed by three major river systems that is indus ganga and brahmaputra when i am calling it a river system i mean to define that the main river along with its tributaries that makes up a river system so basically when these rivers most of them they are himalayan rivers right so when they came down along with them they brought a lot amount of silt silt is like the wet amount of sand wet 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 clay sand right you can find it in the rivers if you stand in a river water you can find something sticky sticking to your legs right or to your feet or your toe so that kind of sand material is the silt so what happens when these rivers they were coming down the hills they brought along with themselves lots of stones you know rocks and this sand and silt particle and they deposited it here that later on make up the northern plains right so and that kept on depositing and depositing and depositing and let later made up of the northern plains so basically this northern plains of the ganga plain is made up of the alluvial soil that is really very fertile now alluvial soil also is classified into on the basis of its age right in the areas that are more prone to flooding in the areas there are areas in the northern plains where every year a huge amount of flood comes right if you talk about there are parts of bihar that are flooded every year right so such areas despite the destruction they have a positive side to it as well right the the flood water along with it comes you know the flood water when it comes you know it also brings along a huge amount of soil so when the flood water recedes the soil being heavier gets deposited and this is the new quality of soil right so basically when we talk about on the basis of age the alluvial soil gets divided into two format bhangar soil and khadar soil right the bhangar soil is comparatively the older alluvial soil that was deposited some time back and khadar soil is that soil basically that is very fresh very new gets renewed after every floods you can say so generally the areas that are very much flooded you can find the khadar soil the bhangar soil is very very thick it's very rough in texture but if you talk about the khadar soil that's very very fine and very good for cultivation purposes right so let's get into detail of it we know that alluvial soils have been deposited by three major river systems in this ganga brahmaputra some parts of it are also found in rajasthan and gujarat and eastern coastal plains especially if you go, go to the delta areas of mahanadi godavari krishna and kaveri you can also find some kind of alluvial soil present there alluvial soil consists of different proportion of sand silt clay okay and in fact if you talk about when you talk about if you're moving towards the river valleys the soil particles will be little bit bigger in size okay and wherever you will find bhangar soil the soil will be comparatively thicker in texture right 
so based upon the age alluvial soils can be classified into old alluvial and new alluvial the old alluvial will have more concentration of kankar kankar here stands for the calcareous deposits i mean deposits of calcium calcium is has a property to harden something right so we have some hard structures or you can see small stones or hard particles that you will find in bhangar soil or bhangar soil theek hai so that is also the old alluvial soil if you talk about the new alluvial ones that is the khadar ones that is comparatively very fine very refreshing you can say and very new that is very fine particles so these types of coarse particles or kankar particles you will not find in the alluvial soils that is new alluvial soil or the khadar soil then if you talk about they have good amount of potash phosphoric acid and lime which are very good for the growth of crops like sugar cane wheat rice and some other pulse crops pulse means dal that you have in your daily vegeta uh, i mean daily food routine okay so they are very fertile soils they contain some good amount of potash phosphoric acid lime and that is very very good for the growth of crops like sugar cane rice wheat pulses okay so we have these alluvial soils now let's talk about the black soil basically when we talk about the black soil beta we are definitely referring to an era where igneous rocks have cooled down so basically they are an outcome of the breaking away of the igneous rocks the igneous rocks are the primary rocks that are formed by the cooling down of lava right so when they formed when they cooled down they formed into igneous rocks over the period of time they got broken up into smaller particles ultimately leading to the formation of black colored soil okay and this soil is very much present in the deccan plateau of india that is towards the southern states of india eastern and southern states sorry uh, central and southern states okay so central and southern states will focus all that and to be precise it's called as the deccan plateau region so the deccan plateau region which is full of black soil that is specifically called as the deccan trap okay so if you someone ask you what is a deccan trap so it is that region of deccan plateau that consists of the black soil okay the soil is black in color also we call it as regor soil so climatic conditions along with the parent rock is resultant into the formation of black soil it's very good for growing cotton right it's a very very good soil for soil for growing cotton also called as the cotton growing soil regor soil or the black soil you will easily find it in the deccan trap so deccan trap is that region of the deccan plateau where you will find the black soil so always remember it it's a good question one mark question right so where you will find if you talk about the states you can find it in the maharashtrian state saurashtra near gujarat region malwa plateau central india madhya pradesh and chatisgarh and also it stands in the southeastern direction in godavari and krishna valleys if you talk about the southeastern part so you can also found find black soil in godavari and krishna river valleys so these are the different states where you will be able to find the black soil okay black soils are made up of clay particles clay is known for retaining the moisture it's very good for retaining the moisture holding capacity it has a good capacity to hold the moisture for longer period of times it's rich in nutrients okay and it contains calcium carbonate magnesium potassium and lime so these are the nutrients that you can find in the black soil moreover the soil gets sticky when it is wet obviously if you take a clay in the hand if you pour some water in it it gets pretty sticky right so definitely after the first monsoon showers the land needs to be tilled with plow and the other machinery so that it becomes cultivable for the farmers otherwise if it gets sticky it will be very difficult for the farmers to perform cultivation on it right okay so when we talk about red on yellow soils the red color is because of the diffusion of uh, iron okay so it's it's one of the same kind of soil the only fact is when iron is diffused it gives it a red color and when it is moisturized it gives it a yellow color we'll study about it so basically these type of soils you will see on crystalline igneous rocks in areas of low rainfall where the rainfall is pretty low igneous rocks are present there you will find these kinds of soils okay especially in the eastern and southern parts of deccan plateau so you can get these types of soils in eastern and southern parts of deccan plateau this soil develop a reddish color due to diffusion of iron in crystalline and metamorphic rocks it's a one marker question here very important one that what gives the red color to the red and yellow soils red soils so red color is because of the diffusion of iron into crystalline and metamorphic rocks and when these rocks have moisture content in it then they will look to be yellow in color okay so when they are hydrated or have the moisture content they appear to be yellow in color where you will find these kinds of soil in odisha chatisgarh southern parts of middle ganga plain and along the western ghats wala region theek hai so these are the areas where you can experience the red and yellow soil it's very good for growing your cashew nuts and all right 
it goes well in these soils moving on further we have the laterite soil so laterite soil looks something like this basically it will be present in such a region where you have ample amount of rainfall as well as the conditions are very hot and humid so that will result into continuous expansion and contraction of the parent rock now what is happening here suppose if i take a rock i make it wet okay when the temperatures go down it will definitely contract come closer when the temperatures increase it will expand so it will ultimately lead to the breaking away of the rocks very simple when these types of conditions are very much prevalent in an area it will give rise to the kind of soil called as laterite soil and this kind of process in the general terms is called as the leaching processes okay let's move on further so laterite soil develops under tropical and the subtropical climate so somewhere in the southern region of india you can come across these kinds of crops it's it's formed due to intense leaching due to heavy rainfall and humid conditions right laterite soils are acidic in nature and they are generally deficient in plant nutrients where you will find it most of the southern states you can find the laterite soil western ghats region of maharashtra odisha west bengal northeast these are the major regions where you can find the laterite soil right and what type of uh, vegetation you will find in this soil you will find deciduous vegetation and evergreen forest but the organic content is missing from these soils that you cannot find you must so definitely these soils are not very fertile and not very good for the cultivation process it's useful for growing tea and coffee so if you want to grow tea and coffee then laterite soils are the best soils to grow in it right that's why you can find in the northeastern parts like assam and all where the tea uh, production is pretty good and southern states of like uh, ne nearby the nilgiris and all where you can find the coffee production okay so laterite soil is good for that arid soil as the name suggests arid means without water i mean the regions that are very very dry so in the desert regions you can find these kinds of soils they do not support a very good amount of vegetation due to the lack of moisture content or the waterfall or the rainfall content okay so it ranges from red to brown in color generally it is very sandy in texture the salt content is very high in some parts of rajasthan you will even find that there is amber salt lake right the salt that is evaporated and used to make the common salt for common consumption so this this is the kind of salt content these soils have so they lack moisture as well as the humans humus <laughs> not the humans right how will it lack the humans it lacks the humus and the moisture content the color can be from red to brown sandy in texture it will have high salt content right in fact at times common salt is you know taken out from these soils it is used to manufacture common salt as well right and in the lower horizons of this lower stretches of this soil you can even see the hard kind of you know textured hard texture substances that are called kankad or you can say deposits of calcium carbonate so that will make the soils more coarse more rough so that is not very good for very very good for cultivation processes okay right let's move on further let's talk about forest soils you'll find this in hilly and the mountainous regions the soil is very loamy and silty sticky soil wet and sticky soil right in the valley sides you'll find it to be wet and sticky that's loamy and silty and if you go to the upper slope regions if you go to the upper regions upper slope regions you'll find it to be more coarse or more rough in texture okay moving on further if we talk about the snow covered areas of himalayas these experience inundation that means they are worn away by the glaciers and all right and they also are very much acidic the humus content is very very low if the farmers are able to practice cultivation then they'll have to take out the uh, terrace farming practices right so definitely it's very difficult to cultivate on the mountainous and hilly regions and if you have to carry out cultivation you need to bring into practice the different cultivation te techniques like the terrace farming or the contour plowing because these soils are very much prone to denudation or soil erosions as well it because it if, if suppose there is a heavy downpour of rain it will be very easy for these soils to get denudated okay let's move further so this map is again very important when it come to soil map so this will be coming for identification remember the states if you talk about the deccan trap this is the black soil region the major black soil region the major black trap region where you can find abundance of uh, you can say the black soil right then we have the laterite soils you can see in slight yellow color then we have the red and yellow soils that are marked in red checks so these are the areas where you can find the red and yellow soils then we have the northern plains that contain the alluvial soils right the alluvial soils majorly you will find in the northern plains western parts of rajasthan will have yellow colored arid soils right 
so when we talk about the soil map again if we talk about the mountainous region that will have the mountain soils or the forest soils so what you need to understand is number one in order to identify the soil map it's very easy to identify first you need to cater to the states remember which states contain which soils simply go and locate those states first and it will be easier for you to mark the identify the map suppose what they'll give you is they will ask you to identify now we know that if we go to the assam wala area assam area we can find two types of soils here if we go to the northeastern region we can either find laterite kind of soils or we can also find red and yellow kind of soils so two kind of soils you should always keep in mind so it's very important and maps are 100% dependent upon practice as well the better you practice the better you perform right the first 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 way of doing maps is first learn how to mark the states on the map once you are done with the states make a chart for yourself write down the states write down the kind of soils simply go and mark those states you will come to know that what kind of soils are present or prevalent there it's the easiest way to solve the map right first learn how to mark the states on the map if you are done with this it gets very easier for you suppose if i know that Maharashtra has some black soil deposits. If I know where is Maharashtra, I can easily identify that this is the place where Maharashtra has the black soil, right? So first, you know where the states lie. Practice these once, twice, and thrice. Once you are very done and well through with the states, it will be easier for you to mark anything, be it soil or be it anything, right? Okay, so we are coming over to the last topic. Last topic of our discussion. I know it has been a really rough ride. I mean, very very long one. so soil erosion is basically carrying away of the top soil cover and that is basically that is soil erosion the top soil the fertile soil cover when it gets washed away or when it gets carried away by the forces of nature it can be wind it can be a heavy downpour of rain any physical factors then that is called as soil erosion it can be caused due to human activities as well like deforestation overgrazing when you construct something then also we are degrading the soil right or due to physical factors like heavy downpour of rain or it can be wind or it can be glaciers so that also can take away the soil right in such cases what happens the soil erosion takes place also when your uh, when your farming techniques are not right that can also lead to soil depletion or soil erosion right at times what happens suppose there are clay soils and there is a heavy downpour heavy rainfall the water will make its way through these clay soils creating deep channels such kind of erosion is called as gully erosion okay and this will ultimately make the land unfit for cultivation calling it as bad land now at times water flows in the form of sheets especially if the water is flowing down a slope it will form in huge amounts it will flow in huge amounts it will appear as if it the water is flowing in the form of sheets it will carry away the top soil along with it and this is basically known as the sheet erosion at times wind also blows when the wind blows it carries away lot of dust particles along with it thus also leads to a kind of soil erosion especially we talk about in the desert areas the wind is very powerful there wind blows away the all the sand particles the soil particles leading it to the degradation of that area of that land area and also to the soil erosion now the question is how to control it especially if we talk about the mountainous region you can see the slope of the mountain or a hill so what do the farmers generally do they plant the trees on the slopes of it part by part this is called as contour plowing or planting the trees alongside the slope suppose this is my slope what i have done is instead of planting trees like this like this or this i have planted the trees on the slope like this so when the water comes down basically it is not impacting my basic grass root levels right so it gets easier for a farmer contour plowing is basically when you are planting along the slopes right when you are planting along the slopes and the cuts so this kind of practice is called as contour plowing when you talk about the terrace farming what you have done is we have cut down the stairs if you go to a hilly region or mountain region this kind of farming is very much prevalent you know what does the farmer do farmer cut down the field in the form of steps or stairs you can see as if you are climbing down the stairs so what happens when water flows down the these stairs it forces breakdown and as a result it is not able to carry away the top and fertile soil right we break down the force of water by making it to pass through certain stair like formations this is called as the terrace farming okay 
now at times what we do is we also plant the crops in patterns in strips you know these are the strips this break down the forces of wind or you can say the water forces because the water is made to split in multiple parts same way if the wind is coming it will have to split into certain parts so ultimately we are breaking down the forces leading it to the conservation of the soft soil as well as the crop such kind of practice is called as strip cropping and the last but not the least the shelter belts we discussed it earlier as well what we do is we plant uh, we plant the trees of different heights which ultimately helps to break down the wind flow we have planted shrubs okay then we have planted a little bit higher trees then the evergreen vegetations so what we are doing is we are forcing the wind to cross over the different elevations ultimately slowing down the wind speed and slowing down the destruction it may cause right so these are the multiple ways in which you can control the soil erosion this kind of practice is called as planting of shelter belts right so it was a real huge journey to be with you all this time and it was really amazing i must say that i'm really 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 feels immense pleasure to be here with you discuss along things with you and how did you feel about it just do let me know in the comment section any doubts you can pour in the comment section as well i'll be very happy to help you out right so in the next lecture that i'll be taking the next discussion that we'll be having and you know let me tell you a secret of mine a very very important secret if you follow this i mean you can follow your own in fact this is what i love to follow that i study while others are sleeping that's a fact because others will never come to know that how good i have studied right that's a ninja technique i work while others are loafing while others are roaming around roaming around wasting their time i love to work at that time next prepare while others are playing well others are wasting their time you are preparing use the time to prepare and dream while others are just wishing wish if this could happen why not make this happen so that's a wonderful wonderful thing that study while others are sleeping work while others are loafing prepare while others are playing and dream while others are wishing okay when we talk about success it doesn't come in a day it needs steps to build it upon and the steps to build success success for you at this point of moment stands for acing your board exams in the best possible way i'll be here standing with you as long as your board exams are there and even after that to mentor you to guide you to be there with you as your friend as your mentor as your guide as your teacher in whichever way you accept me right so we are here as a friend of yours pw has always been an emotion for all of you for all of us right and you guys are also an emotion for us and that's the fact that connects both of us on me to you you to me right that's how it goes isn't it so finally we have come to the end of this discussion of arts resources and development within the complete chapters now it's a task for you you have to go through all the notes that you'll get on physics wala website or the physics wala application if you haven't downloaded download it from uh, the google play store enroll in the ignite batch the link is also given in the description it's absolutely free why i am telling you to enroll is it's just because you will be able to get the questions that i have specially framed for you in the batch itself and also the notes class notes that we have that we have discussed today okay so wishing you all the best and keep practicing keep learning keep growing we'll meet together in the next video because it's time for me to board my spaceship and go back to mars in the meanwhile i'll get my spaceship ready you have something refuel yourself and get ready for an amazing amazing session that we will have very soon bye bye bachcho take care and stay tuned with pw hey jadu i am coming bye bye